All right, I think we are live. Um, so we can go ahead and jump in. You may have already seen my cat, Mr. Nancy, who will probably be joining us for um, periodically throughout the presentation tonight. Um, thank you guys all for coming out. Um, oops. Of course, I am now having technical issues. Hmm. Um, strange. Um, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, my name is Carla. If you've been coming to these seminars for a while, uh, you've probably talked to me at some point. Um, I uh, have a master's degree in historic preservation that I finished in 2008. And since 2008, I've been working in some capacity for the Chicago Bungalow Association. Um, I was, you know, completely broke student. Uh, so I literally said just like anything you guys have for me to do, I am happy to do it. And uh, as a result, I was, you know, hanging right on kits and basements and writing National Register district nominations. Um, I also ran the programming for a while. So uh, part of that is that, uh, you know, in doing pretty much any, any and everything that came along, uh, I got to talk to a lot of you guys throughout the years and um, also watching all of the different programming, putting together programming, uh, you know, really gave me a window into what people wanted to know more about. So we decided uh, several years back to do a, uh, you know, a maintenance 101 session, basically. Um, so, uh, you know, it's kind of a greatest hits of all of these things. Um, I can tell you, I might not be able to answer every single one of your questions um, as we go through this. And, and as we do go through this, I want to tell you, uh, let you guys know there's a Q and A uh, little session at section at the bottom of your screen. Um, please be sure to put any questions you have in the Q&A. Don't put the questions in um, the chat section because you won't be checking that. So definitely do Q&A um, and we'll be checking those and I'll check those uh, probably just at the very end since it's kind of hard to keep going back and forth with the presentation in that. Um, we uh, often also run a panel just because sometimes questions get really deep and specific into like electrical or something. Um, I'm not an electrician, I will burn your house down, so I will not uh, you know, tell you beyond the sort of basics what to look for that way, because um, I would not want that in my conscience, I assure you. <laughs> so, uh, so we run these panels where we have people who are really specialized, who've been doing this stuff for decades, um, and you know, we, we probably will do something like that in the near future as well, just to kind of get those really nitty gritty questions from you guys. Um, before I actually launch into the presentation, uh, you were probably emailed a link to our um, Bungalow Maintenance 101. Uh, um, hmm, why can't I make this smaller now? Sorry. Hmm. Let me see how. Forgive me, I've done this a few times, but trying to get out of this screen so I can show you another screen. Ah, there we go. Not sure why it worked that time. Um, so I just want to show you guys, um, you know, if you didn't get that link or if you just want to be able to come back and look for some of the resources we have online going forward, um, you know, a lot of our members have said they, they really enjoyed, we've just started doing these online, uh, that they really enjoy having this access to it in this way um, for a variety of reasons. Um, some people have mobility issues, um, some people have kids, and it's just really hard to get out to a library. Um, you know, obviously with everything happening with COVID-19, we have a lot of vulnerable members or just people who are generally concerned or live with, um, you know, a parent, etc. So, uh, so having these things online is something we're going to keep, you know, we're going to um, keep uploading more things online. We wanted to, you guys to know where these resources really were. So our website is just, you know, chicagobungalow.org. Um, if you go to how to and you go to maintain your home, um, you can actually download the Maintenance 101 uh, booklet there as well. So you can either download it or I believe, yes, you can also, if you don't want to download it onto your computer, you can actually flip through it this way, which is really cool. Uh, Gillian just hooked this up for us. So uh, all this information is in here. I'm going to cover this stuff tonight, but just so you know, you can find it here as well. We're also recording this whole session. 
So that recording will be emailed out to you guys. Um, so uh, that's another nice takeaway we'll have for you guys. Um, also, you're probably going to be like, hmm, that sounds really great. Yes, I do need to repoint, uh, you know, the south side of my house or something. Um, we have this really great referrals page. Um, and, you know, we have sort of different labels. These are people we've actually worked with before. Um, homeowners like have recommended over and over certain contractors, so we tag those. Um, some people have sort of coupons for you guys. So we have, I mean, you can see so many categories here, um, you know, of, of different, um, you know, people that we've worked with or, or that our members have worked with. So maybe we haven't met every single one of these contractors, but, um, but one of you guys, or three of you at least have, uh, for them to make it onto this list. So, uh, so that's another handy thing we have. Um, seminars, uh, let's see. Also, we have a how-to home video series we have been working on the last couple of years now. So we just released our um, Repointing Your Vintage Masonry series where we cover all kinds of different stuff. So you can go back to that, you can see it live, which is you know sometimes a bit more engaging than my slideshow as much as I'd like to say I have the best slideshow ever. Um, <laughs> but we've even got like illustrations or some of the stuff, uh, you know, chimneys and gutters, different things to sort of focus on that way uh, as well. So here's just another resource for you guys. Um, let's see. So it's just a good opportunity to show you that. And okay. Okay, I don't think I missed anything here. Um, all right, so um, as I said, this is kind of a, a greatest hits seminar um, based on questions you guys have had through the years. Um, so it's just an overview, but also a lot of people aren't quite sure how to sort of tackle the maintenance issues. They get overwhelmed. Um, you know, what am I going to do with my Sunday? Uh, you know, so it's just um, kind of going to help you guys out with, with that in ways as well. So why do we maintain our homes, right? Um, safety is a huge issue. Uh, we'll talk about all of these things uh, in a lot more depth as we go through, but safety is always number one. Um, unless you own a yacht, it's probably the single largest investment that you're gonna be making. Um, resale value, uh, things like, you know, curb appeal, if you look, you know, like just sort of the basic maintenance, um, sort of the superficial maintenance matters. Um, you know, in terms of resale, but also, of course, if there's leaks, if there's mold, if there's anything like that, I mean, that could really kill any any sale that you guys are gonna uh, hopefully push through. So, so that matters. Um, longer life for your mechanical system, systems and materials. Uh, stuff can last a really, really long time. Um, I come from a household where it was like, everything was like so meticulously maintained um, that we didn't have a lot of time on the weekends because we spent so much time. My father would, was very, very into maintenance. But I gotta say, um, the older I got, the more I really appreciated that. And um, everything always worked perfectly, like clockwork. So. Um, uh, so yeah. Um, also, you should be comfortable in your home, and that can mean a lot of different things, and we'll we'll go through that. But uh, but uh, yeah, just to go over health and safety again. Um, there's a lot of gases in our homes, actually. So we have radon, we have uh, carbon monoxide, um, we have all kinds of things being produced through our mechanical systems that are getting potentially trapped in our homes. So we have to be very aware of what's going on, what's in the air around us, right? Um, so first you wanna worry about health and safety, as I mentioned. Um, after that, you know, the sort of basic physical integrity of your building, right? Um, I mean, everybody wants to, you know, redo their kitchen first thing, because it's fun, right? Like a lot of it is just kind of, like it's fun, the results are immediate, like it's great, but uh, really, really prioritize these things first. Um, so health and safety, basic physical integrity, uh, leaking roof and other damage from that actually bleeds into health and safety as well. So it's another thing to always keep in mind, um, always look for uh, things like, you know, settling and cracked foundations, etc. Leaning chimneys. I mean, if you live in a bungalow, like there are so many times you're, you're walking down the street and you'll see this chimney that's just like, like leaning like a leaning tower of Pisa and and you know that that gangway between your home and your neighbor's home is not very big and so uh you know that thing can not only uh damage you know your own home and falling and create a big hole in your roof um water pour in and all kinds of nightmares but it can even actually affect your neighbor's house so 
things like that, or, you know, somebody walking down the gangway for that matter. So, um, uh, so yeah, those things really matter <laughs> to pay attention to them. Um, energy saving measures after you've sort of made sure that there's this, uh, you know, the basics sort of, uh, safety, you know, and security around your home, energy saving measures, then you can start thinking about upgrading your mechanical systems. Then you can start thinking about insulating, um, and also changing your behavior, which I'll talk a little bit about too, in terms of saving some money. Um, and after that, then you can think about things like the important historic features of your home, um, the more cosmetic stuff that you just want to be a little bit prettier. Maybe it's fine, but it could use a little sprucing up, um, you know, uh, stuff like that. So, and kitchens and bathrooms, frankly, too. So, um, just to, you know, warn you, I, I didn't realize how many things we actually need to pull building permits for when I first started, you know, putting this stuff together. Um, things like, you know, a new furnace um, or hot water heater, uh, masonry in a lot of case, cases, plumbing. Um, so, you know, make sure you're, you're on the up and up with this stuff. You don't want to get, you know, any violations. Um, so, you know, just definitely check out the Department of, of Buildings and make sure you have a contractor who's who knows what they're doing and how to lift these things up and it really knows how to push these things through. So just something to keep in mind if you're not having any permits pulled by your contractor through this process and something is wrong. Um, okay, so back to health. Um, just to break down a little bit more about how to, you know, deal with things like your air quality. So radon is actually the second leading cause of lung cancer. So it's pretty serious stuff. And studies have shown that Chicago has really high levels of radon in certain areas of the city. Um, it doesn't matter where, it, radon does not care what your socioeconomic status is. It does not care um, you know, what your house sold for. Uh, it, it does not care. So it's trapped um, in the bedrock actually underneath your home. And that is where it's coming from. So it's just a matter of what's under your home, right? And it's in different parts of the city, it's scattered. Um, we did a lot of testing years back and um, really just found that it was all over the place, but in some areas, not so much. So uh, it's a good idea to, to test that, especially if you're going to air seal and insulate your home. So you don't want to trap, by sealing up your house more, you don't want to trap get more poisonous gases into your home, right? Without having, you know, making sure you're, you're doing what you can to keep those gases out um, and properly ventilating, adding ventilation where needed, et cetera. So very important. Um, you know, these, they, you can get these radon tests um, at, you know, big box Home Depot kinds of stores. Um, I think they're like 10 or 15 bucks or something now. Uh, you hang them, they look like kind of like a little mi microwave popcorn bag. You can hang them in your, in your basement and uh, then you mail them away usually. And then you can actually check your sort of your rating online and see how that is. Um, as of last year, and I, I haven't checked to see if they're still doing this, you could email environment at cookcountyill, cookcountyillinois.gov, and uh, they would actually you could get free radon kits that way. So definitely worth trying that as well. Um, now, smoke detectors. Uh, I you know, was never quite sure where exactly are they supposed to go. <laughs> so, um, so just so you know, uh, you should install them inside, inside of each of your bedrooms and uh, on every level of your home, including your basement. Fires definitely do start in basements. Um, on levels without bedrooms, uh, put them in the living room or family room um, or near the stairway to the upper level or in both locations. I mean, the more the merrier. They're not very expensive. Um, can't really hurt. Uh, in terms of carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide is really, really sneaky. So you have to be super careful with it. Um, you know, you can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't smell it, and it doesn't really bother you for a while. So if uh, you, you need something else that is superhuman to test for you, basically, um, if you're only going to install one of them, put it near a sleeping area so you can wake up. Um, but I would definitely recommend putting at least one on every one of your uh, levels of your home. Oops. Sorry. Okay, so um, a little bit about electrical. You might have a knob and tube wiring still if you have a bungalow or older home. Um, this was really, really common. Uh, I think they're installing it up through 40s, I want to say. Um, 
have to double check that. But uh, you know, when they were installing this, and you know, this is the same reason why I've never heard anybody who lives in a, a bungalow or, or just a vintage home for that matter complain about how enormous their kitchen is, right? <laughs> because um, we didn't have appliances like we have today when we were building these homes. We didn't have enormous refrigerators with double doors and uh, you know, any number of other things we plug in in our kitchen. So the, the, basically your electrical was for lights and not really much else. So, um, you know, we didn't have air conditioning, we didn't have any of this stuff, right? So uh, what you'll see in the bottom right hand corner, this is, you know, what knob and tube wiring looks like. And, uh, you know, it has this uh, rubberized cloth um, and these are ceramic tubes. So you have to make sure if you do still have this, you know, try to make sure it's not fraying like this. It hasn't been too compromised. Um, in some areas, and I'm not sure if it's true in Chicago, but it could have some impact on your ability to insure your home because they could see it as a fire hazard. So be aware of that. Um, uh, other, you know, really common issues with older homes, you know, there's not enough outlets, which is pretty easy to remedy. Um, there's too many fixtures on one circuit oftentimes. So, you know, don't have like your toaster oven and your hair dryer on the same circuit using them at the same time. Like you're going to fail. Like it's just not going to go well. Um, if you know, if you get this older wiring. So, uh, you know, or you haven't upgraded uh, your system in general. So, um, so check for fraying, um, you know, also just, you know, label everything clearly when you do get things organized and put together, of course, that's a huge help. Um, also, you know, if you're going to upgrade your wiring, if you're going to go ahead and open up your walls for something, like make sure that you get everything you can possibly think of done, you know, <laughs> that you need to have done in those walls, um, whether it's your insulating or your, you know, upgrading anything else, or maybe you need, you know, to redo your plaster work or do something like that, like do it all at once. Uh, you do not want to have to open those walls multiple times. And planning is a big part of, you know, saving money in general as a homeowner, right? So, you know, the order in which we do things has a huge impact on our budget. Now, uh, what kills homes? Water. Water kills homes, like pretty much across the board. You could have like a cathedral with like a four inch hole in the roof and it would like just destroy this cathedral like quicker than you could imagine. <laughs> so, um, so a lot of our job as homeowners is just to make sure we're keeping the water out of our house and away from our house. So we're gonna talk a bit about that tonight as well. Um, obviously, we're going to start with the roof, and that's kind of just, you know, general plan of attack. You're going to want to go top down. This water is going to go top down, right? So just a little about shingles. So shingles, you know, you can buy 20, 25, or 30-year shingles, right? Um, that is, the, they are 20, 25, and 30-year shingles if you live in, like, a snow globe, basically, with no real weather. Um, they tested these in laboratories. There's no wind, there's no sun, there's no temperature differentials. Um, so realistically, you're going to want to knock about five years off of those numbers. Um, other things will affect it. If it's a south-facing uh, roof, then you're going to have more sun hitting it. If you've got trees, maybe they're blocking more. Like, you know, there's, of course, there's variables but just in general, something to keep in mind. Um, now, just to show you the installation order, if you've never actually seen it, um, you know, you're gonna start with your plywood sheeting. This is gonna go right over your rafters, right? Then you're gonna have a self-adhesive a waterproof underlayment. Um, you can imagine you want kind of more than just plywood keeping water from getting into your house. You have this waterproof underlayment, then you have a felt underlayment, and then you have the shingles that are put on top. Um, this is one of those things where it's kind of like, eh, it's nice if you've got a cousin who, you know, needs a little extra money and has the summer free or something, but like, eh, you don't really want to mess with like having like, your, your roof um, done improperly. You got to lap these shingles in a way uh, that they're really going to drive the water away. So um, I definitely would recommend hiring professionals. I'm sure we've got plenty of recs on our, on our website where I showed you in the beginning. Um, so just, you know, maybe don't mess with that too much. Uh, beyond that, you know, when do you replace them uh, is, of course, a good question. So this sort of like curling thing is usually due to there's too much heat in your attic. Um, it's not able to escape properly. So it's drying them out from the bottom and you're going to get this curling, right, which is not a good thing. Um, cracks and shingles over time. Shingles do just sort of dry out. Sorry about my cat. Um, <laughs> they do dry out over time, of course. You're having, you know, again, all this wind and, and sun and everything. Um, and so they get kind of brittle 
Uh, you know, you think of asphalt shingles, they should be really pliable, but they, they do get brittle when they dry out. Uh, and then you'll notice uh, that they'll start to start balding, basically. And a really good way to figure that out is when you're cleaning your gutters. If you see a lot of these little, you know, black and brown, gray granules and stuff, um, that's a pretty good indication that your, your shingles are balding. So um, they'll tell you one way or another. Um, beyond that, uh, you want to not have more than three layers of shingles on your roof. So I would say if your roof looks like tiramisu, uh, it's probably time to to tear that roof off and you know redo the whole thing, which nobody wants to hear because it's a pain, but you got to do it. Um, you know, older homes are, are built; they're so they're so tough, and uh, you know they're sort of overbuilt a lot of the time. But there is a limit to how much weight. And when you have multiple layers like that, it's like it's like if you're layering your clothes, right? And the more layers you have on, the warmer you are. And there's sort of like trapped, you know, heat in between each of those layers. Well, the same thing happens with your shingles that way. So the heat buildup is actually going to compromise them more quickly. And uh, you, you know, warranties may not cover them also if you have too many layers, because you're not supposed to have more than three. So, you know, more than three. It's time to you know get another uh, layer. You're going to have to do a tear off, really. And um, if you do strip the layers, just be aware that your house is extremely vulnerable at that point to the elements. So, you know, as much as you're possibly able to pick, you know, a good you know a good time to do it where there's not going to be a storm or something, um, definitely want to do that. Um, okay, so gutters. I'm like a zealot about gutters. Um, it's like the low hanging fruit that we just like so often ignore and it causes so many problems like really expensive problems if you don't take care of your gutters um as i said you know water is what's going to kill your house right so you've got to you know not only you know make sure your roof is secure but you have to channel that water away from your house away from your foundation so and that's what gutters do right and same thing with your garages your garages need them too it's kind of hit or miss i've noticed on who's has them who what garages have them um same principles right um, so, uh, you know, they're, if your gutters are leaky, uh, they're going to rust. They can, you can get mold build up in there. Um, you know, if there's ice, it's going to pull the gutter away, uh, from your roof. Um, you know, and that'll happen if you have too many leaves and things in there, the water's going to stay in there and then, you know, ice can form. Um, uh, you know, you could end up, uh, the bottom right picture here. This is really common and it's one of those things it's like ee, so maybe your gutters are great and they're new and you know whatever but this is a nightmare um this on the bottom right is how you get you know all kinds of leaks in your basement um deterioration of your brick all kinds of stuff so uh, you really are going to need to drive that water away so you're really this should be extending outward you should have a slope like basically your uh your soil should go up like right above the foundation line and, and, and sort of slope downwards. And that'll help with the water. And you're gonna to have to kind of keep your eye on that because over time, you know, that can erode. Sure, it's just soil does that. But um, so, you know, it should be sloping away. And then the gutter itself should extend way beyond uh, that point too. So, uh, you know, just one of those really simple things, really inexpensive things that makes a big difference. Um, yeah, same thing, you know, gangway, like all kinds of, you know, sidewalk damage, all kinds of stuff. Like water is so much more powerful than we, than we think it is. <laughs> um, also, yeah, it'll kill your landscaping, which what a shame, right? Um, so cleaning them, right? Uh, you know, you're going to stand on a ladder and you're basically going to clean out as much gunk as you can. It's relatively simple. Um, hangers, that's these, these guys that sort of tie the gutters back to, uh, to your roof there. Um, make sure they're secured and they're not too bent. Um, this little handy thing, you know, one thing about, you know, leaning your ladder up um, against, you know, your, your gutters to clean your gutters is you can really dent your gutters, right? So, so this like little device here has these little feet on it. So it rests on the actual house. If there's a way to get an attachment for that, go for it. Um, otherwise, just be aware of the fact that your weight is pushing in on this, uh, this metal gutter. Um, while you're up there, look for holes and cracks at the seams. Look for any rusting that's happening. Um, you know, sometimes people get excited in terms of this mixing metals, you know, they're like, ooh, I have some extra money for copper gutters. So they'll have copper just like in the front or something, and then it'll attach to the, you know, their old gutters, uh, you know, or on the sides or something. And unfortunately, when you're mixing metals like that, it's going to cause a lot of deterioration of that metal. So you're actually going to end up with more holes in your gutters and all these other issues. So if you're going to do copper, you got to do all copper. 
Um, you know, whatever material you're using, be consistent with it throughout. Um, so also, you know, gutters, they need to be pitched the right way. So, you know, you have these, these downspouts, right? Um, but if the gutter is not going to reach those downspouts, if it's tilted away from the downspout or if it tilts towards the center, and then you'll you see that a lot where it's sort of tilting inward at either side and then, you know, you're sort of dripping through the middle of the, of the gutter. It's not even getting to the downspout hardly. Um, so uh, make sure that they're pitched properly, of course. Um, flush that remaining gunk down those gutters. Um, sometimes people use a pressure washer to, uh, you know, just kind of help out and get some of that extra gunk and dirt, run it through and down the downspout. That's great. Just make sure when you're doing that, you're not, you're not hitting your shingles. Um, get it, you know, make sure it's pointed down and away from your shingles. Otherwise you can actually do a bunch of damage to those while you're up there because those power washers can be pretty, pretty powerful as you know. Um, and again, make sure the downspout drains, um, you know, several feet from the house as far as you can. This is great if it can go right into grass, obviously. Um, I know, you know, it's hard with, um, with the gangways. If you have a downspout, if it's disconnected from the city sewer system, it's a tricky thing, those gangways, right? Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think we talk a little bit about this later. Um, there's a couple of things you can do. Uh, the best thing you can do is be on good terms with your neighbor um, in ways too, um, but I, I'm pretty sure I, I talk about that a little bit down the line, so I'll save that point. Um, and when you're up there, be careful. I only put this um, as an extra extra cautionary warning. I see people, uh, you know, being a little bit foolish with this. You should always have like three hands, you know, or three, uh, three hands, uh, you know, <laughs> three of your limbs touching something when you're on a ladder, right? Um, so while her, she's, you know, your partner might be very well intentioned with their arms up in the air to catch you, they're not going to be able to catch you. Like I got news for you. So especially if you outweigh them by, you know, 60, 70 pounds <laughs> like this guy. So, so be aware of that. Be really careful um, if you're doing this yourself. There's tons of gutter companies, you know, around Chicago that can help um, as well, of course. But um, just, you know, watch yourself up there. Uh, okay, flashing. So we're still on the roof because, as I said, water is super important for maintenance. Um, so flashing is a thin layer of waterproof material that keeps water from getting into places it doesn't belong. It's a very good and apt definition. Um, sheet metal is a great material to use, um, copper or stainless steel at any of the roof transitions. So anytime there's like a, a juncture in your roof here, like, you know, like there's a seam here, right? It's not a flat plane. Anywhere you see that is somewhere you're going to need flashing because it's a vulnerability in your roof line, right? So um, uh, this I see a lot, this tar, you know, and people, oh, it's a temporary, I'm just going to smear some tar up there. I mean, I gotta be honest with you guys, like I have never seen anyone go back and remove the tar to put like the metal, like it's not gonna happen. Like just, you should just do it right from the beginning. Um, the thing about the, the tar is that it, it, you know, within like a year or so, because of all the UV stuff and exposure, exposure to weather, it gets really brittle, it breaks. You're actually, um, uh, you're sealing water inside of your chimney brick as well at that point, and that's going to deteriorate your chimney brick right at that in, in, in crucial juncture. Um, and then if you do end up, you know, putting it over metal or something, there's a chemical interaction um, that further erodes the metal that was there originally. So really um, try to stay away from from that stuff. Don't put it around your chimney. It just never never goes well. Um, and uh, you know, these, this is kind of like the ideal. You wanna have, just like with your shingles, it's like overlapping flashing light. This is another thing, you know, if you're gonna spring for something when you're putting a budget together of what you really need to focus on with your house, uh, this is a good one to, to consider. You, you kind of wanna have this done properly. It's gonna save you so many headaches if it is done well. Um, so yeah, these are just, you know, more areas to consider for that as well. So ice dams, uh, these, this is something we see a lot with bungalows. Mm. Because we have these fabulous overhanging eaves, which are great for temperature regulation. I mean, the thing about those, those, that overhang that you have in your roof line, if you have a bungalow, is if you think about it, in the summertime, you know, when the sun is high in the sky, it's blocking that extra heat. So it's keeping your house cooler. And in the wintertime, all the leaves drop off of the trees, right? And the sun's lower in the sky. So you still are able to get that solar gain. So it's just like that like real simple, wonderful uh, little addition, but it's functional, that overhang. It's not just about looks. Um, everything when they built these was, was functional. It's why your, 
your windows, you know, your top sash drops on your windows and all of these different things. They were all built in uh, climate systems for your house before we had central heating and cooling, right? Um, anyway, as charming as that is and wonderful and helpful, uh, you know, there is this issue we have uh, commonly with ice dams. Now, ice dams are caused because, as you can imagine, you're, um, you know, you're going to get, even if you, you don't use your attic, um, it's a space and you've got a hatch and it's closed all the time, as you can imagine, when you're heating your house in the wintertime, some of that heat is going to get up into your attic space, right? Um, when that happens, uh, you know, say there's a bunch of snow on your roof, it's going to melt some of that snow. And then the water from that snow is going to go, you know, trickle down your roof until it gets to the very end. And this overhanging eave isn't really in that sort of thermal envelope of your house, right? It's like your fingers outside of your coat where your fingers get cold, you know, if you don't have gloves on, right? Um, so once it hits that part of your house, it's colder. That water that was running down your roof starts to freeze up again. And you have these ice dams that cause all kinds of issues. Um, they can mess with your shingles, you can see, because the water's expanding and popping them up when it turns to ice. Um, can mess up your gutters. Um, they're just a pain and they're really common. Um, the good news is that, uh, oh, and also, yeah, it makes your roof vulnerable where you can see, you know, if your shingles are messed with, then you can start getting some leaking. If you've got insulation up there, it's terrible. Like it's, you know, nothing you want to deal with. Um, so uh, a couple of things. Uh, some of you might have noticed, uh, you know, these on your soffits, uh, the areas, like if you're standing under your house, you're looking up at your roof, um, you'll see your soffits right here. And you're going to have cool, fresh air entering those soffits from outside, right? And you're going to have this sort of circulation along your roof, so it's going to keep the temperature more steady. If you block those, then you can have some issues. So you actually do want to have um, like baffles, even if you have insulation, um, they can install uh, baffles, which sort of... Uh, keep a little bit of an airway open for that airflow to, to continue. So there's also, again, a very good reason why those little vents exist there. Um, also, you know, insulation and stuff, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can regulate the temperatures in your attic space. So um, you do not have to be the victim of ice dams forever. So um, some other problems, we just want to talk about masonry a little bit and we can talk about gangways too before I forget and gutters, uh, downspouts. So um, so efflorescence, you might see these like white powdery salts on the face of your brick. Um, that's called efflorescence. And efflorescence is basically, you know, your brick is made out of clay and clay has all kinds of minerals in it, right? So um, oftentimes it's caused because if you've repointed your house, for example, and you have a mortar that's harder than the brick itself, um, which is very common because typical Portland cement mortar that um, a lot of masons use today is a lot harder than the mortar they used when they were building your house in the 1910s and 20s. Um, harder meaning more, uh, less porous, right? So now your brick is more porous. So water gets into your wall and it used to be it would evaporate through the mortar. That's why the mortar was always softer. But if your mortar is harder and more dense, then that water sits in your brick and it slowly, slowly migrates out to the surface of your brick. And as it does that, you know, all kinds of minerals and salts and stuff sort of sit on the surface of your brick, right? Um, is it a big deal? Not really. You can sort of brush it off, but what it is, is it's indicative of a larger problem. Like your walls are getting wet and they're not drying out properly. So it could eventually be a problem. And it can get to the point where you see this, it's called spalling where the face of the brick um, actually comes off. And this is where you've got, um, you know, those crystals and everything within the brick unit are, um, you know, they expand to a point where they just pop off the brick. Your brick is actually pretty soft inside. So when they were making these, um, you know, back around the turn of the last century, they were, uh, you know, there's no holes in the center of them like newer bricks. Um, they're, they're really, you know, dense and meaty. And, and they basically have a sh like a, a shell around the outside of it. So a brick is like a tooth, I always say. Um, if you lose the enamel of your tooth, then inside it's really soft and it's kind of no good, right? Um, so uh, you want to prevent that. So, you know, when you are repointing your house, you need to have a mason who knows which kind of mortar he should be using for an older home, for example. And we have 
as I showed you at the beginning, we did a whole video series on this stuff where we get like real geeky about it and <laughs> like talk a lot about it. Um, we can also recommend uh, good masons for you guys and tell you where to get that kind of mortar, tell your masons where to get it um, with other partners that we have. So um, the really, you know, it's such a simple thing. It's just a stupid material, but it can like really make or break your, your wall, unfortunately. Um, so uh, one other thing, you know, if you are repointing, you know, check your mortar color maybe and like it's pretty it's pretty obvious when you when you don't um and also you know uh they call this cutting a joint where you um you know and i think i actually talk a little bit more about this um maybe in another slide or two but um you have to cut that mortar back it shouldn't be uh sort of bleeding over onto the face of your brick ever it should always be uh, a little bit recessed from your brick we're really bad about this in Chicago, especially in our, our common brick on the sides of our buildings. Um, I don't know why uh, this is a thing here, but it's it's not a good thing um, where the, the, the mortar is really kind of bulging, right? So um, it looks, not only does it look not right, um, but it actually, you know, it, it also traps more moisture into the brick itself. So you have more problems with efflorescence and spalling. Um, now this is called rising damp. Uh, this is where you have an issue where there's water that keeps hitting the base of your building over and over again. And um, through like what they'd call a capillary action, that masonry is sucking all that water up into the base of your building. It's just like, like a sponge sucking it up, right? So um, this, is, um, this is an issue that's really common, I think with bungalow owners too, because of that gangway between your homes, right? And you're either like, the lucky neighbor or the unlucky neighbor a lot of the time because you have um the sidewalk the shared sidewalk they can tilt one way or the other way it's either tilting towards your home or away from your home right and if you're lucky it's turned tilting away from your home and your neighbor's getting all that water that you don't want um this is where i said it's a really good thing to be friendly with your neighbor um they can uh you know, maybe you can sort of like negotiate then and figure out, uh, you know, how are we gonna fix this thing, um, especially if you're on the receiving end of it, right? There's also, um, you can do like a, they call I think a French drain. Um, and a French drain is where you're, the side will go pitch towards the center. You've probably seen something like this before. So there's actually sort of like a crease in the middle of it. So it can kind of like get that water going, um, you know, away from both of your homes, um, you know, or, you know, have something more, Pervious, so water can actually like soak through so it's not the sidewalk that's determining you know this like mad rush of water one way or the other um but it, it it is tricky it's tricky again if you don't have your gutter tied into the city sewer system or your downspout rather um where's that water going to go so you need to find grass or you need to find a slope away from your building uh no doubt um okay so uh just to go back to you know your masonry walls um, again, you know, clean your gutters, uh, then you're not going to have that rising damp if the water's not pooling, if you're able to get your downspout away. Um, we just talked about the gangway pitching. Um, you know, I, listen, I love ivy and vines. I mean, I, I you know, I, I was an English major, it was a poetry focus. I love <laughs> my green and like all those things. Unfortunately, it's like really not good for your masonry. Um, some things aren't as damaging as others, but basically what happens with those vines is these little like tentacles go into your masonry and, um, you know, there's just this pumping of water like, into your wall that way. I mean, they're, they're, they're chipping away at the, um, at the mortar and they're just, they're putting so, it's putting so much water into your brick. So yes, it's beautiful, but, um, yeah, not a good idea. Um, don't sandblast your brick. This is, uh, not really been legal in Chicago for a long time, but unfortunately, like this is a result. This is not what it's going to look like right away. Right away, it's going to look clean and beautiful, and you're going to feel like a million bucks. Like, oh, it looks like it was just built. Um, and then, in you know, a handful of years, all you, it's like you've basically created a, a million teeny tiny cracks all along that exterior, the enamel um, of your brick, right? So uh, you've made it really, really vulnerable. And over time, that's you know, gonna show, trust me. So, um, oops, so definitely don't do that. Um, if you do wanna power wash it, even that you wanna do it like a 200 to 600 PSI. Some of those power washers are real strong. So um, you know, be aware of that. 
And you know, when you're repointing again, use uh, a proper mortar with a higher lime content. Um, and again, definitely, I really recommend checking out those videos you made on it. Um, they're the most recent ones that you'll find on our website. Okay, so how do you actually repoint? Um, so first of all, you need to remove the mortar carefully. You can really do a lot of damage just removing uh, the old mortar. A lot of times too, I've noticed uh, the mortar is just not removed. You'll have a crew come out to repoint and they'll just stick the, um, the new mortar right on top of the old, which just fails like almost every time. You really have to cut deeper into the joint. It needs more to stick to. Like that, that mortar needs to stick to um, you know, more of the brick surface area itself to really get in there and stay. So, um, you know, uh, nobody wants to be outside all day with a, with a you know, chipping out uh, your, all of your joints. But I will say, it's really hard. These circular saws are really difficult to control um, when you're dealing with a vertical joint. So, you know, if you're gonna use these circular saws to, to get in there and you wanna go about three quarters of an inch deep, um, you know, only use that on the horizontal joints. Um, they're just too big. I mean, you're going to cut into the, the, the actual brick most likely here and here because um, the, the, the blade is just too big. So, you know, the best practice is really to use that for horizontal and then for vertical, just chip that stuff out. Um, watch for dust. The city requires it. This can create a lot of dust, put a lot of stuff into the air and that's no good, right? Um, again, make sure you, you get the appropriate mortar um, match the color. Now you can match the color if you're doing it and you're just doing some spot repointing, which is often all you need. Um, you know, you might want to match the current color of the mortar. If you're going to redo the whole wall, some people like to figure out what did this used to look like because, you know, time and pollution and weather has no doubt tinted your mortar over the years, right? So um, you can go either way with that, depending um, on your preference. Um, then in terms of cutting the joints, uh, that is where you actually take back some of that mortar. So as I mentioned earlier, you want your mortar to always be a little bit recessed from the masonry itself, right? So um, you could do flush, even that, like usually you want it to be cut back a little bit. This is pretty common um, strap joint. So um, unfortunately, like, I don't know, this extruded, that's kind of its own special thing. And I don't know why in Chicago, again, we just, it's because we don't even bother cutting out the old uh, mortar. So it's just this blob, then water gets trapped in into your masonry and it's just a nightmare. So, um, so yeah. Now, lintel replacement. Um, did I show? Ah, sorry, I didn't talk about this. Um, so you may also have noticed this stepped crack. Um, surely you've seen it if it's not currently in your own house, right? Um, don't let this totally freak you out. It looks really intimidating. Um, that means that you need to replace your lintel. So your lintel, that just is an indication that in the last hundred years, very, very reasonable, um, it has rusted. Um, water has slowly gotten into your wall one way or another. And, um, you know, that rust expands, I think, like, you know, three times the original size of the steel lintel, right? So it will actually sort of jack up your, your, um, uh, the lintel will actually sort of jack up here a little bit and create this step pattern. Really, really common. Um, really not a huge deal. And I'm sorry, these are like the best pictures I could uh, really find online, even though they're not uh, Chicago brick, but it's the exact same idea. So, um, you know, your lintel is right above your window here and it extends a little bit beyond the window opening, right? Um, so what you do is you basically remove all of the brick um, right above that, you know, so that you have the full lintel exposed. Um, and then whatever, you know, like in this case, this last block here, the whole thing would have to be removed, of course, because the lintel extends like halfway into it, right? So you're going to remove all of that carefully, very carefully, because you're going to re put those bricks back in. Um, then you simply, you know, like, look at that. I mean, that's like probably yeah, a good three times the, the size of what it originally was in terms of expansion. Um, then you're going to lift that puppy out get rid of it. You're going to pop a new lintel in. Um, you're going to, it'll be a primed, a new steel lintel with a rust inhibitor and painted um, for a little extra protection just to keep that, more of that water, you know, at bay. Um, there are differing opinions about whether or not to install a continuous 
continuous flashing on that. I've I've heard both sides. Some people say you really don't need it. You didn't you know have it originally, and um, other people are like you may as well since you're already in there. Um, so again, up to you or the preference of you know whoever's doing this work for you. Um, and then you just carefully you know put those uh, bricks right back, and you won't even know that anything was you know changed. Um, okay, so windows. <clears throat> and again, I'll, I'll go to questions at the end of this just to kind of get through this. It's a little bit of an awkward format doing it online in that way, but, um, but kind of good to hold things to the end anyway. So just plug in your questions as you have them. Again, in the Q&A section, not in the comments section, please. Um, okay, so common conditions. Um, if you still have your original windows, we get a lot of questions about it. So I just like to take some time uh, talking about these when I do this uh, presentation. Um, just because, you know, if you've replaced them, that's fine. I'm not gonna, you know, like, that's fine. Um, but uh, just to take a minute to discuss them, uh, a lot of people have, these are really common issues, like painted sashes, where, you know, there's like 37 layers of paint, you know, you've had, so you, so you, people have been there over the years, you've had a lot of people in and out, you can't quite open it. Um, there are a lot of ways, you know, you can sort of deal with that. Um, uh, including things like even a pizza cutter. I know somebody used to try and cut through all those layers. Um, so there's, there are ways to deal with it. Um, pulleys are often painted. Uh, so, you know, you can't open and close your windows easily. You know, these are gunked up somehow. You have uh, broken sash cords. Um, these windows are weighted. Oops. Um, you'll have, uh, you know, these rotted out sills and rails. Uh, I will say that it's kind of amazing how, um, sorry, now I have like a fly, um, kind of amazing how you can bring these windows back from the dead. And I think I talk about this in the coming slides, so I won't get too into it now. Um, you know, then you'll have also, uh, you know, this putty right out that's holding all of the glass in place here and just chipping off, so it's another common problem. Missing hardware, of course, over the years, things happen. Um, so, some solutions. Um, most of this, you know, cheap tools, pretty easy. Like I said, pizza cutters even, you know, <laughs> putty knives, sort of tap them in there to kind of get the window loose, um, work slowly through the paint, you know, usually start the thinner the better, you know, you don't want to, I mean, I have a pry bar on here, but that's, you know, sometimes a little more than you need in terms of uh, strength and weight. Uh, that way you could do some damage, so be careful. Use the, the least invasive things first. Um, liquid wood for your rotted sills. So, if you use liquid wood and you know let it do its thing and then sand it down it's actually kind of amazing especially if it's something you're going to paint over anyway because it's already a painted uh windowsill or uh even a window um highly recommended really good results with that um you know removing your old putty um and glazing putty i'm going to walk you guys through that a little bit uh, missing hardware just go to you know there's um the rebuilding exchange in chicago and uh, the Evanston Rebuilding Warehouse in Evanston. Um, I used to work with the Evanston Rebuilding House Warehouse as well. They just moved locations, and I actually don't even have the new address for that. Um, but those are places where you can get a lot of older hardware. Um, the great thing about uh, Chicago bungalows in particular uh, are that they were built during this massive building boom, right? 1910s and 20s in Chicago, insane amounts of building. So a lot of the buildings that are torn down, a lot of our building stock, a lot of them that are redone, um, it's all the same hardware, all the same wood, um, all the same fixtures, even stained glass windows if you want to replace, like oftentimes they'll be from the 1910s or 20s because that's when so much of the building happens. So we just have a lot of stock here. So it's actually not that difficult if you do want to get your old hardware back or something that looked like it, um, you know, to, to get it at a, a resale shop like that. Um, um, also, I will say, if you just have it, it's been painted a whole lot, um, crock pots are kind of amazing. You throw it in a crock pot and let it do its thing. And then that, like, you know, all that paint and everything just comes right off. So you don't have to scrape it. You don't have to, like, put all these horrible chemicals on it. Um, and it does the work for you. So lots of, like, little tips and tricks. I highly recommend, like, YouTube videoing anything, uh, you know, that you are, are contemplating um, just to see all these videos. I mean, there's just, there's tens of thousands of them. So um, they're really, really useful to, to show you how to do stuff on your own. Um, also in terms of uh, air infiltration, so those sash locks, so um, 
sashes are, uh, you know, each of your windows, if you have these double hung old windows, um, you know, and I, I remember thinking like, I'm like on the third floor, why do I have locks on my windows? Like, is, is like Batman going to break into my home or something like what, what is going on right now, you know? And it turns out that actually those are on there really uh, more for, to, to sort of seal that top and bottom sash so that they're actually like tight and sealed in their spots to keep air out. So it's to lessen air infiltration in large part. They do function also, you know, on the first floors and stuff as like an extra little protection too, but um, I thought that was really interesting. Um, also, weather stripping your windows goes a long way. Um, you have somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, you can get really fancy with it or you can, you know, just kind of, um, you know, figure it out, um, you know, how to sort of keep air from flowing, but you can actually take, you know, metal strips and sort of create these channels where it'll trap the uh, air so it's not going to get into your home if you do it, um, you know, with a professional. So also makes a big difference. Um, if you are going to reglaze your window, these are the tools that you'll want. Again, this will be available afterwards, so don't worry about writing this stuff down. Um, but, you know, putty knife, uh, painter's tool, just this guy, um, a heat gun. Uh, some people are anti-heat gun. I learned how to do this with a heat gun, so I just am more comfortable talking about it. Um, uh, you know, a paintbrush, um, some glazing compound, glazier points, these little triangular points, that's actually what kind of holds the, the, um, the glass in place. And I'll show you all this stuff um, as we do a little step-by-step -step now. Um, and an exterior primer too. So, you know, even if you totally uh, redo your windows and you strip them all and you wanna go back to the original wood, you're still also gonna have to paint the outsides of your window. Like the windows that are facing the outside of your house, you should never have those bare because uh, there's just too much sun and weather and stuff. So always going to be painted on the outside, even if the wood is exposed on the interior of your house. Um, so a lot of times, you know, by the time you're getting around to this, the glazing putty is pretty, pretty dry. It's pretty easy to chip out. Um, but you can also uh, soften that with a, uh, a heat gun. So if you do that, however, there's a big temperature differential that you're going to create between the center of your glass, say, and the outside of, in the outer edge of the uh, window, right? These heat guns are really hot. So you wanna keep that moving. And actually, the way I was taught was run that thing over the center of the glass periodically just to get that temperature so it's not so different because your glass can shatter. And that's a real bummer, right? <laughs> so, um, so, uh, Something to keep in mind, um, some other people said that they use tin foil. They put tin foil down on the glass um, to sort of reflect some of that heat up. It worked fine for me when I did the old, you know, just make sure I hit the center of the glass too with the heat gun periodically thing. But, um, but that's just my limited experience. Um, once you've done that, you know, examine the wood for any damage. You don't want it holes in, you know, in the wood, you know, fill those in with epoxy and stuff because you want this again to be as airtight as possible. Um, if you're replacing the actual glass, if it does shatter, and it's not uncommon, um, you know, first of all, um, you know, that wavy glass is kind of the original windows that you guys have. Um, it's kind of, it can be a little bit expensive, which is funny because you can just basically go up and down an alley and look for all of the windows people are throwing out in their alley that just got window replacements. So if you're, if you're looking to, to do this for your own windows, I would highly recommend um, keeping your eyes peeled for you know, window replacement signs in the front yards of, of your neighbors and going around and, and grabbing some of the windows that are thrown into the alley and hoping some of that glass might be back up for you. Um, it's what every contractor I know does. Um, so if you're replacing glass, so measure it uh, wood to wood, opening, but take away an eighth of an inch off of that measurement if you're going to have it cut somewhere. Um, then you're gonna lay down a thin layer of the glazing compound. You're gonna set the glass on top of that, and then you're gonna push these glazier points in on top of that. Once you've got that all in place then, um, you're gonna make like a, it's like a breadstick or a snake. Um, I say breadstick because people have very strong reactions to snakes. Um, so sort of make a breadstick, lay it along, you know, uh, each of the, you know, the, the sides here, and then you're gonna take your putty knife and just sort of smash it down onto there um, as much as you can. And then you're gonna sort of like cut that line afterwards to, uh, to smooth that off. 
Uh, wait a week, which is hard. You're going to be impatient. You're going to want your windows back in, uh, but you have to let that cure. And um, make sure too that this putty should really overlap onto your glass a bit, um, which makes sense. So make sure that's um, at least a 16th of an inch going over the glass itself to seal that in, right? To seal that glass um, in place and keep the air out. Um, so I've seen it where people do this and like do a beautiful job and they get like a little too crazy cutting that putty away at the end and then you like see the edge of the glass again. It's like, oh man. Um, so be aware of that. Um, make sure. Okay. Um, so exterior painting then when you are painting your the outside of your sashes this way um, or your sills and stuff um, or actually, you know, a lot of people, you know, you may not all have bungalows. Um, and even if you do have a bungalow, you might have an enclosed porch in back. So whatever, you're doing outside painting. Um, keep in mind that uh, this paint has to deal with, um, you know, outside temperatures and stuff for a long time. Um, you're supposed to repaint every five to eight years. If you do, you're, you're a rock star. I don't think most people necessarily do that, but, but that's what, you know, you're supposed to do. Um, and this really keeps the moisture out of your house, which again is our, our main goal here. Um, so, you know, you wanna get rid of the old paint first. Um, keep in mind if you're sanding, anytime you're sanding paint, so they used lead paint up until 1978, I believe it was. Um, so you're gonna have some lead paint somewhere in your house. Um, you know, so be very aware of that. If you are sanding, you don't wanna breathe that in. Make sure you have a good mask on, make sure you're cleaning all of that up and anything that's falling on your, um, on the ground, um, you know, on the side of your building, be aware of that too. Clean that up. Um, you just don't really wanna mess with lead paint. Um, so, uh, you know, get rid of the old paint. Um, you could also just sort of, you know, scrape away the majority of it if you don't want to be that, that crazy about it. Clean it up with some mineral spirits. Um, you know, treating the raw wood, I was always told two parts of boiled linseed oil and one part turpentine, ideally. Uh, you're going to prime it. Um, you know, you want an oil-based uh, primer, ideally, really. Um, but also be careful not to paint when it's too sunny or hot or wet. Um, I used to do a lot of rebuilds in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and go down several times a year. And we did a lot of exterior painting and, you know, we'd go down for a week at a time. And I remember we did this whole shotgun. Shotgun house is, you know, a very long house and, you know, all the scaffolding and we're out there and it's like a million degrees and there's like biting caterpillars falling on our hair. And like, I mean, it was like terrible. And, uh, Sure enough, we go back the next day and it's all like bubbled up and we had to scrape and redo the whole thing. So uh, weather matters. You kind of want it to be like, you know, ideally like, oh, it's like in the 60s or 70s and it's like kind of a cloudy day. I know it's hard to plan these things, um, but that would be kind of ideal uh, time to do it. Also, I know everybody wants things to look all clean, but please don't paint your limestone if you haven't already. Um, what it does is like, kind of like how the mortar traps that moisture into your masonry. Same thing with limestone, that the paint's gonna trap the moisture into your limestone. Um, our limestone from our quarries um, in Chicago was either, um, usually, uh, this is a Bedford limestone um, that you'd have, and that Bedford quarry, it was gray. It was always gray. So it's not dirty, it's totally normal. It's totally how it should always, you know, pretty much how it always looked, maybe is slightly different. Um, but, you know, I just wouldn't, uh, definitely wouldn't recommend doing that. If you want to remove it, just do it the gentlest way possible. It's probably already trying to push the paint off of it. Same way if you paint brick, the brick's like, get off, I can't breathe. So it kind of pushes the paint off. Um, but, you know, you want to use like as gentle a brush as you can. You don't want to use anything too um, acidic because it can kind of eat into the masonry itself. So, you know, there's all kinds of guidelines on that stuff as well uh, that, you know, I think we have some resources on our website, also worth a Google um, if you do want to remove that stuff. Uh, exterior ceiling. So um, just the places that, you know, you want to do a walk around and caulk, you know, your, your home periodically, make sure all those junctions, you know, you're not getting moisture in, you're not getting air infiltration. Um, so this is a, just a nice little drawing of where to caulk and where not to caulk. Um, again, we have the book online, so please check that out. 
Um, tools needed, fingers in a cock gun, like pretty, pretty easy, right? Um, you know, don't, uh, you know, using caulk and tar as an alternative for flashing, like with your chimney and stuff, don't do it. You don't want to do that. So, you know, use metal for that stuff. Know the difference um, of, of where it's supposed to, where it's supposed to go. Um, keep in mind that water needs to drain. So you don't want to caulk under your flashing, under that metal flashing, or horizontally under siding or window trims. It seems like we would just want to seal it all up, right? But that, you know, water always finds some way to get in. So you want it to be able to drain out, right? And so, you know, it's going to go down, right? So make sure things like that. Also, if you had siding, for example, if you had like wood siding on your home, you know, you don't want to caulk all those horizontal joints because you're just going to trap water behind the siding, right? Um, so it seems, uh, seems a little counterintuitive, but, you know, when you think about it, it makes sense. Um, also, if there's a gap that you're trying to caulk that's larger than a quarter of an inch, um, don't do it. Don't, you know, sort of try to bridge this big gap um, <laughs> with your caulk gun. Um, you can use uh, foam cording to kind of help with that. So uh, foam cording, you can just get at any hardware store. I mean, it's just basically kind of like a rope that you put down in between and it acts as like a little bridge and then you can caulk so you don't have such a gap. Um, yeah, and it just requires maintenance. You know, it's, it's a lot to do. Uh, you'll come up with a plan. You know, year by year, uh, we go, you look around, just check on things, um, you know, weather and UV light really uh, does erode that, that caulk pretty quickly though. Okay, so ear infiltration. Um, I don't know if you guys knew this, but older homes are a little leaky. So uh, not always such a terrible thing, but um, here's, you know, some sort of typical places that you'll, you know, have air, you know, coming in and leaving. You've got, you know, vents, electrical outlets, kitchen fans, faucets, you know, anywhere you have these pen penetrations, anywhere, you know, uh, you're going to have air infiltration, right? Um, it's not always where we think it's coming from. Also, fireplaces are kind of a heartbreaker. You're always going to be, it's going to be a constant battle whether your flue is closed or not. Um, fireplaces definitely are a big source of, of um air leakage, um, you know, ductwork too, really common, like you don't think about it because you can't really see it, um, but uh, there's, you know, we lose a lot, of, a lot of air that way, a lot of conditioned air, unfortunately, too. Um, so yeah, in your attic space, um, these are common areas. Um, we have uh, an energy savers program where we do air sealing and insulation through the Chicago Bungalow Association. You probably have heard about it, if not, there's also a ton of information on our website about that. Um, it's an amazing program. And, you know, these are just some of the areas that we, uh, that we deal with. Um, these are sort of your overhanging eaves here. So we, we block um, this area underneath here. Um, you know, these are your knee walls where, um, I'll explain this. So actually, I think I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the, in the slides ahead, I believe. So let me not get too far ahead of myself here. Here we go. So, okay. Where do you insulate? Uh, how do you decide this? How do you figure this out? We will help you with that. If you do our energy savers program, our contractors have done, I mean, just thousands and thousands of these at this point, if you can believe it. Um, but, um, what you first need to figure out is what your thermal envelope is. And your thermal envelope is everything that you're going to heat and cool. So it's your condition space. Some people never use their attic and that's a lot of square footage. Like you might have a thousand square feet up in that attic. Um, so that's a lot of heating and cooling of space that has like your high school yearbooks and like, you know, your aunt so-and-so's, you know, whatever that you can't bear to get rid of or, or what, you know, like it's a, it's a lot of money um, that you're, you're sort of throwing out out the door essentially. So if you don't use your attic space, your thermal envelope is going to cap here, basically at your attic floor. So the, this is your conditioned space, right? So you don't, so you want to insulate here. Now, if you do plan on using your attic, whether it's finished or you think in the future you're going to finish it, then you're actually going to want to insulate um, up, you know, your whole roof line here. Um, what you don't ever want to do is insulate here and here. So you don't want to trap gases in your attic. You've got all kinds of, you know, things, um, your mechanical systems are pumping all kinds of gases up there. 
and through there. And so you wanna be very careful that you don't ever do that and trap gases up there. So it's one or the other. You're either doing the floor of your attic or you're doing the ceiling of your attic, the roof. Um, so the areas that we really focus on are, um, and we have also a whole other seminar on this. Um, so I know I'm kind of, this is just kind of an overview, but um, your band joist is in your basement. When you're standing in your basement and you're looking up at the ceiling, that's where your rim and band joist is, band joist. So, um, you know, again, anywhere you have these penetrations and you have all these, you know, these rafters going through, you know, to the, you know, like your, your wall here, obviously that's a lot of penetration. So, so you have to make sure that, you know, that is, um, is definitely um, air sealed. Um, you wanna make sure any, any plumbing penetrations and penetrations like this, uh, you know, you definitely also wanna hit, this is in your attic space, but also be very careful because if it's a heated pipe, you have to use a fire rated foam around it. Be very, very careful about that if you're doing any of this on your own. Um, same thing in your basement, you know, uh, hit your plumbing penetrations. Um, so these are your knee walls, these little vertical members here. And oftentimes they'll be uh, like drywall or something, you know, along them. Um, and then these are your outer, your overhanging eaves. Sorry, this is kind of hard Oops, to um, show you here. Um, but, you know, what would happen is a wall would be built here if you were planning to actually finish out your basement, um, you know, and they would insulate behind these walls and then block underneath here with foam as well. And I know it's, it's a little hard to, to sort of see what's, <laughs> what's happening here with my cursor bouncing around. Um, other basic stuff is you want to weather strip your exterior door, um, caulk around your you know, frames, these little door sweeps. It's amazing what they can do, right? Um, uh, but uh, also I should have said, before you even think about insulating, do your air sealing. So air sealing is just where you're using um, like a foam or caulk to get all of those little seams insulated, right? Um, blocked off, right? Then you can pump all the insulation stuff on top of it. Imagine if you were like, oh no, we forgot to air seal, but we insulated, like having to like remove all of this insulation if you even can to get in there to, to air seal is a nightmare. So always air seal first. It's actually the most bang for your buck is air sealing. It's incredibly important and it does, it does makes everything um, way more efficient. So definitely air seal first. And again, that's all of these things I just showed you um, that involves like foaming, you know, these areas or sweeps and stuff too. Um, once you've done that and determined your thermal boundary in the attic, um, you know, you have to, um, so you have to uh, pump cellulose insulation in, into your attic space. So you, if you are, um, actually planning to, uh, if you're not using your attic space, if you're not going to finish out your attic space the way that we do it, which seems to work pretty well, is we actually um, first tackle these uh, overhanging eaves, right? And these are your knee walls here. Then um, we often create a path up here for people just because they're like, well, where am I supposed to put my storage? Like I still want access or, you know, there's a there's still your dormer window in the front of your house up here on a bungalow. Um, you know, they just want to have some access still to their attic space. So we create kind of a catwalk basically, and then we can insulate, you know, pretty much everything else up there without much uh, of an issue. Um, we do cellulose to R49. R is their resistance to heat flow, um, is the, the R rating on your insulation. So that just, R49, um, it's basically, uh, you know, they calculate it based on um, the kind of insulation and then the thickness of it. So they'll be up there with like rulers, like measuring what this all looks like. We also have videos on all of this stuff. So it's easy to kind of get in the weeds on it, but just kind of want to give you guys a good overview. Um, also uh, insulating your, your knee walls, which actually we don't show here. Um, if we do that, uh, you know, the, we'll use a bat insulation. That's usually if you are going to use all of your attic space, you know, we still, are going to insulate the knee walls where you have those overhanging eaves and stuff behind there. Um, also back porch. Back porches that get real cold, right? Those like sort of finished, maybe this was originally finished, maybe it wasn't. Um, so, uh, you know, we figured out a system on those two uh, years back where you could attach a rigid board to the floor joists underneath. And then you fill that cavity 
um, with cellulose. So you have um, that, that rigid board underneath uh, sort of acts as a, another floor underneath your actual floor, if that makes sense, to keep all of that air from just pumping in. And then because the walls are just frame walls, uh, they're not masonry usually on those enclosed porches, right? Um, that stuff you can easily, uh, you know, fill with insulation um, in those wall cavities, no problem, and it makes a huge difference. Okay, so heating, um, you know, you either have hot water or you have steam heating, uh, if you still have a boiler in your home. Um, so a system is comprised of a radiator, a boiler, radiators, and piping. So, you know, you want to try to have somebody come out each fall, because you don't want things going wrong in the winter, I'm sure. Um, and they'll check a variety of things here that I, I mentioned. Um, uh, I will say, if you want somebody to come out in the fall, everybody wants somebody to come out in the fall. So make an appointment way in advance, um, as much as you can possibly make an appointment in advance. <laughs> so um, they're gonna fill up so quickly. So, um, and again, check our, our list of, of contractors on our website if you're not sure who to call. Um, you know, and they'll just check, you know, make sure the pilot light is working. Um, that the condensate drain isn't clogged. They'll check for corrosion and leaks. Um, pitch is a big problem. Like in your basement, you might have a bunch of pipes and those pipes get kind of wonky over time. Sometimes contractors uh, move them, I've noticed too, without much consideration. Um, the pitch of that pipe is, is, is really important, especially for, for steam heat. Um, it's like the, the water has to sort of be at a certain level so that the steam can still go over it. So it's like a relatively precise angle you need to have these pipes at. Um, so you'll have all kinds of problems if they're, uh, if they're all wonky. Um, cutoff valves, um, you know, your, uh, you know, gauges matter. They'll be able to help you out with that. Um, the pitch of the pipes, often if you hear that banging noise, I have radiator heat and, you know, you hear, dum, 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 you know, so it's, um, that's often a result of things being improperly pitched. Um, cheap valves, um, if you have valves are too cheap, that you'll hear that hissing noise. Uh, also be careful with um, water leaks. You'll see often around the base, the feet of your radiator, there'll be water leaks that the radiator itself, you know, might need to be tilted a certain way and it's not tilted at the right angle. Um, and also insulate your pipes, you know, that's um, uh, super, oops, important. Um, now there's some debate about whether you should drain your systems. Um, I, Every time I like think I have like a definite answer for people, somebody like raises their hand, you know, and pass and they're like, actually, no, we've discovered this and this and this. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what to tell you on that. <laughs> I would say when you have somebody to come out and check on these things, um, ask them what their opinion is and, and why. Um, you know, it's, it's because the fresh water can actually be corrosive. So sometimes the idea is like, if you drain them and you replace the water, then you actually can create more problems. So, um, so I would see what the latest Intel is on that, honestly, um, because I just can't seem to lock an answer down. Um, uh, your thermostat. So the thing about thermostats, that's kind of wonky too, is if you have a newer one, it might not actually have a steam setting on it. Um, if it does, it'll say, if there's a hydronic setting, um, that covers steam and water. So go for one that has a specific steam setting on it. Um, otherwise your temperatures might be way off and you'll be like, why is this registering so strangely? Um, typically your boiler, boiler is going to fire up and run for about 15 to 20 minutes at a time when the thermostat is actually tuned properly. So if you're cycling um, way more or less, um, that's kind of a tip off there. So common plumbing issues, uh, low water pressure, um, this corroded pipe is very, very common. Even if you don't use your, you know, your water's turned off for a very long time, you turn it on and sometimes it'll be a little pink, you know, that might just be some, a little corrosion, um, sort of clearing its way out. Um, calcification and buildup, uh, you know, common. Um, again, improper pitched pipes can, can you know, have a, a, a pretty big impact that way. Um, frozen pipes, this isn't happen very often with bungalows, I don't think, unless uh, this happens out on a back porch, if you somehow added, you know, plumbing and it's an uninstallated back porch area, um, you know, those pipes need to be within the thermal envelope of your home. They need to be within your, your conditioned space. And so um, if they're not, you can have pipes, pipes burst. Um, 
I had this actually in an apartment years and years ago, my pipes burst and it was terrifying. It was like Amityville horror. There was like red water running down my walls. I was screaming, it was terrible, it was terrible. But um, so be very, you know, very aware of that. If you are going to add pipes to, you know, a frame unconditioned space, you're, you're gonna need to insulate those walls. Um, also that, that lovely sewer gas smell um, is uh, hydrogen sulfide. So that's usually improper seals in your pipe venting. Um, those should vent the gases out through the roof of your home normally. Um, so they just get dried out uh, oftentimes. Um, your, your, uh, your water seals and your floor drains and stuff as well. So uh, oftentimes you just need to sort of pour some liquid down there and make sure that uh, that's actually covered and that the seal's not totally dried out. Um, holes can be caused by corrosion, uh, blocked, broken, cracked pipes and drain lines. Um, so just be careful. Those gases, you know, outside of not smelling so great, they actually can, can be kind of dangerous to you and your pets. Uh, so basic recommendations, um, insulate your hot water supply pipes or you're just, you know, all that energy is just being wasted. It's such a waste. Um, you know, turn off your drain and exterior hose bibs each fall, like shut that off, off. Don't just turn it off at the handle, shut it off inside. Um, you know, dripping faucets actually can, you'd be amazed how much, uh, dripping faucets and toilets, uh, how much water actually can, can be, can go through there. Especially toilets, you have to be really careful. Um, like you can really rot out the floorboards underneath there and then it's just a whole other headache. So, uh, you know, that's usually just a matter of a rubber ring needs to be replaced underneath your toilet. Um, if you're not comfortable doing it, it's really easy to, to you know, find a, a sort of a handy person who can come and help you out with that. For sure, it's not a big deal. Um, you know, and maintain caulking around your tubs and sinks and stuff too, so water's not getting in places you don't want it to. Um, beyond that, um, I will say that, you know, a lot of what we do in terms of, you know, keeping our home maintained and energy efficient, you know, we want everything to be automated. We have this idea that, you know, everything can sort of take care of itself and never needs to be replaced. Like everything needs to be um, repaired and kept up pretty much. <laughs> like, like we, we just, it just does. Whether it's a new building or an old building, you're gonna see all kinds of issues. I will say old buildings, at least the materials are a lot sort of hardier, have a much longer material life than, than newer materials. Um, but you're gonna need to do some maintenance. Um, so little things, you know, like um, in terms of, again, energy efficiency, like if you have AC units in your windows, um, you know, don't leave those in all winter. Those are going, it's going to be a you know, big waste of energy and it's so much cold air pouring in, um, you know, and, and potentially water and other things too. So, um, you know, it's a pain, hire the neighborhood kid for 10 bucks to pull them out of your window if you need to, and, you know, take it from there maybe. Um, you know, closing your chimney flue, use your, those window locks. Again, they're not necessarily for a burglar who's going to get you on the third floor. Um, they're also to, um, actually keep keep air infiltration out uh keep your vent and radiator space clean and clear uh, replace your furnace filters regularly really really important um such again like low-hanging fruit easy just follow the instructions on that and follow a basic maintenance plan um so uh you know the not yet critical mid to long-term planning um you don't want uh you know you don't have to have a catastrophe and then be like oh no i need you know, $40,000 to take care of this thing on my house, just start setting money aside now. Come up with a plan as early as possible. Um, you know, things that are, um, you know, in terms of your mechanicals, you know, you can sort of predict, you know how old they are, you know, maintain them as much as you can. Um, maybe you can kick that out another five years if you need to or whatever. You know, you're going to have to go through and sort of determine what's really that important. Um, you know, energy efficiency uh, upgrades are always good because, you know, you'll probably end up getting some savings back from those. So that'll eventually pay for itself, depending on what the upgrade is and how long you're in your home. Um, again, updating kitchens and bathrooms, so fun. Um, but like, have that be a separate fund that you're sort of gradually saving uh, on if you have these other critical repairs that you need to have done. Um, again, health and safety first, then make sure the envelope of your building and everything is is sound uh, structurally, keep all that water out. Um, and then you can start, um, well, then I would say energy efficiency measures um, to a degree, and then, you know, start thinking about the really fun cosmetic stuff. Nobody wants to hear it, but that is technically the best way to do it. Um, 
you know, you also can, you know, plan for things like uh, creating more living space in your attic. So bungalows specifically were built in a way that um, they were intended to be affordable, always really, um, with the exception of some bungaloids, we call them, of course. Um, but really they were supposed to be in a, a way of having, uh, you know, sort of getting the American dream um, in an affordable way. So they intentionally did not finish out attics in bungalows. It was one of those things where just like this, like, here's what it's going to cost you. Maybe it'll cost you eight, 10 grand, you know, when they bought it in 1917. Um, you know, eventually maybe you can, you can actually finish out your attic and then, um, you know, as an investment, um, sell it for more eventually or whatever, or keep it for your family. So just a fun little fun fact, but, um, uh, yeah. And planning for your needs as you age too. Uh, we did a really great seminar a little while back about, uh, you know, aging in place and what that looks like and little changes you can make. And one of the takeaways on that was just, don't wait until it's already hard for you to get around. Uh, you want to definitely, um, you know, take care of that in advance as much as you can plan. Um, so making a maintenance plan. So uh, I would say grab a notepad, do a walkabout, walk around your house, look, look at your roof, look at your chimney as much as you can, check out your gutters, how do things look, you know, write some things down. Um, when you're doing this, when you're putting something together, you know, don't be like, I'm gonna get 700, and I do this. I mean, I do this, I'm the worst. So don't do as I do, do as I say. Um, but, you know, pick a few things. Like you're gonna to wanna to stagger these things out, space them out, right? Um, focus just on the next six months and what you're gonna do. Um, one thing I read online that I thought was good was, you know, write everything down. And then, you know, next to that, have a little key, like must, should, could, and later. So I liked that, I thought it was useful. Come up with a schedule, um, have an area to save all your manufacturer's instructions and manuals that are gonna help you with stuff um, and uh, keep it somewhere, you know, in some closet somewhere, all in an envelope or whatever, so that you have that and you can access it when you need it. Um, and actually I don't have those handouts, um, but, uh, but we, uh, Basically, if you go online, and I think that there's some stuff also recommended in the Maintenance 101 manual, um, if you Google like home maintenance plan, there are so many suggestions. I mean, and some of them are like really crazy spreadsheets, and some are just like, I mean, as if you took a crayon and just kind of, you know, like whatever your style is, whatever's going to work for you, figure it out in a way that just doesn't feel so overwhelming. Um, so I was going to do a pop quiz uh, on this, but it looks like people, just to see if people were able to use the comments, um, but it looks like people are able to use the, the question and answer, so I'm not going to do this. Um, so I'll just answer these questions for you, which is kind of lame and not as fun as if we were in an actual library together, but uh, maximum number of layers on a roof before it's a tear off, three. Uh, what is a thermal boundary? That is the space you're actually conditioning in your home, the space you're actually going to be heating and cooling in your home. Uh, how do you know it's time to replace a lintel? That was that staggered cracking pattern in your brick. Um, how do you know there's an excess of carbon monoxide in your home if you don't have a detector? This was a very sneaky question um, because you don't is the answer. Um, again, you can't taste it, you can't smell it, you can't see it, so... Um, so I was being um, tricky. Um, and who was the first non-native settler of Chicago? Just because we should all know this, being Chicagoans, um, also fabulous museum, you should definitely visit. Um, and that was all I had for you guys tonight, but I can now check out some of the Q&A. Um, okay, let's see. We moved into a bungalow with a finished attic where the sloped ceiling is insulated as opposed to the knee wall. Um, I guess, I mean, so for that, um, the, um, I, I would, I'm not sure that you, you could, you could have the ceiling and the knee walls both insulated. And I'm guessing probably otherwise you'd have like, just like these little corners, um, you know, these really like low corners in your room. So I would guess your knee walls might still actually be insulated, um, or you could always insulate behind them uh, retrospectively, retroactively. Um, I'm not sure if that, um, 
answers your question. It's kind of a hard thing to answer without seeing a picture. This is where it's kind of a bummer. Um, a lot of times people will like bring their phones up to me in a seminar <laughs> for it. Um, so I guess I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'm not sure if I've answered that properly. I apologize if I, if I didn't quite answer that. Um, just might need a little bit more information. You can also write us, um, you can also email us at uh, info at chicagobungalow.org. And you know, we're pretty good about responding to things pretty quickly. Um, a serious settlement issue. My bungalow's on top of a hill and the living room has a four inch separation. Um, probably you'd want like a, a structural engineer to take a look at something like that. I would find a, you know, if you have a general contractor already that you've used, or if you know a general contractor, I would say, um, you know, probably a structural engineer for that. Um, do you recommend replacing plaster with drywall um, or plain walls or doing kitchen? Um, I'm, a, I'm a big, plaster fan. Um, drywall is cheaper, but the thing about plaster is that it's really, um, it's really healthy material. It's really breathable. Um, it doesn't mold. It's very durable and it's very forgiving. So if it cracks, you can very easily repair those cracks. You don't have to take the whole wall down. Um, in drywall, what it is, it's basically like a whole lot of papers are smashed together. So if there's any water or moisture as there would be in a kitchen, um, you know, you have a better chance of having that sort of absorb into the wall and get kind of moldy. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm on team plaster, but, uh, you know, but I understand that it's a lot less expensive and kind of easier to deal with, with, uh, with plywood. Um, uh, so suggestions on how to repair plaster, repair plaster walls. Um, we used to have a really great seminar on that. Uh, I think generally what happens is you want to cut away an area like sort of around where the crack is and then and then have like a mesh um, acting as like the, the lav behind it and and then plaster over that and smear it. I am this is a little I have not done this myself, so I would this is a little out of my scope, uh, but it's pretty it's really forgiving, I can tell you that, um, and easy to sort of smooth out and deal with. So that's another one. Um, I have to see if we actually have another seminar coming up on that, uh, but we definitely recommend some, some pretty, some plasterers in our, um, in our recommendations of, of contractors as well on our website. So I would check that out and see, also really a good YouTube Google, no doubt. Um, uh, okay. Okay, great. Um, oh no, I'm sorry that you have to leave, Jennifer. We talked about this earlier. Um, so I noticed the white minerals on some brick in the basement after the last heavy rain we had. How do you take care of that? And what is a larger issue um, uh, that's causing that, basically? Um, so um, hopefully, yeah, this will be recorded too, so we should be all right. But um, so the larger issue for something like that is my guess is that water's probably coming in from the outside, um, like from your gangway area along the side of your house. And again, either like your, your sidewalk is sort of pitched that way and so all the water's going that way or you don't have, um, your landscaping's not graded away or your, your uh, downspout is running right up against your house there. And so the water's discharging along the base of your house. And so that water's getting into your basement and it's basically getting trapped in the brick down there. Um, especially a lot of people have painted the brick in their basement, so that's going to trap it even more. Um, but either way, you're just getting way too much water into your masonry and those minerals, um, as it's the water's evaporating out of the masonry, those minerals are um, sort of shedding onto the face of your brick and they're sitting there. So you're going to need to address that problem on the outside. And eventually, you know, especially if you have a, a dehumidifier in your basement, um, you can dry that wall out uh, pretty well at that point, but you've got to address the source of it first. Um, I'm going to take, let's see, maybe two more questions. I think that's my cue. Um, so yeah, just a couple more questions. I'm sorry, we're, uh, we're sort of bumping a little later than I realized. Um, um, okay, so again, the plaster walls. Um, settlement issue. Um, I'm not sure, uh, how can I get help with beautification? I, I guess I'd need more information on what is meant by beautification. Um, that could be landscaping, that could be uh, good restoration experts. But again, we have so many names of uh, so many contractors listed on our website. 
um, definitely encourage you to, um, to check that out. Um, uh, let's see, we spray insulation in the attic to help prevent ice dams. Um, uh, you know, we have a whole sort of system that I mentioned earlier on how to do that. Um, I would say just be careful with spraying insulation because again, you need to make sure you have circulation coming through your soffits as well. So you don't want to block that off. Um, so it's a little bit more of a technical question um, than what I might be able to handle right now. But, uh, but you just want to make sure there's some ability for airflow to sort of happen up there. So I would be, I'd be a little leery about that um, in your attic space specifically. Um, um, I mentioned how bad sandblasting is for exterior brick. I, I did mention that earlier in the talk. Um, don't sandblast. If you want to clean your brick off, um, you can power wash it, but keep it at a, like 300 to 600 PSI, lower PSI, even for that. Um, your brick is fine. Your brick is beautiful. You know, don't mess with it too much. Uh, in sandblasting, will will destroy it. Um, absolutely correct, James. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about removing paint from limestone. Um, uh, so, you know, just gent most gentle method is always the best method. So I would say, um, you know, a, a brush, you know, the least abrasive brush, you know, start as soft as you can. Um, don't use harsh chemicals, um, you know, try to keep things as light as possible, starting with that. Um, there's um, some preservation briefs that the National Park Service sends out that cover these topics pretty well. And I'm pretty sure there's one on removing paint from masonry. Um, uh, we can, I can probably find that and we could send that out as well uh, as a follow up with this. Um, and actually, you know, all of these questions, um, Gillian is working behind the scenes right now. We've got a bunch more. Um, they're all gonna be saved in a document. And so what's, what'll happen, we can actually just in our follow up email I can reply to these, the ones that I wasn't able to get to, and point you guys to some additional resources. Um, but uh, yeah, we're already past 7.30 now. Um, but thank you guys. I hope this worked okay for you. Uh, we're still getting used to this format. Um, you know, I think that there are some advantages to it and to having more stuff online in general. And again, this is all going to be recorded, which we've never had before with our seminars, really. So um, I encourage you guys to go back online. You visit anything that you know you need a reminder on. We also, um, you know, have a whole maintenance 101 booklet that was created specifically around this and as a resource. So um, definitely check that out on our website too. We have all kinds of resources. We're always trying to get you guys as much info as we can. Um, Again, I hope you know we can do a panel of some sort again too, so we can like really dig into some of these issues more than I'm able to um, as someone who's not a contractor of everything in the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we we really try to 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 get as much done as we can here. But um, thank you guys so much. Um, looks like we had a pretty good crowd here tonight, and we'll talk to you soon. Um, always, you know, feel free to reach out to us. We're still working from home because of COVID for the most part. So, um, but we're checking our emails and we're getting as much info to you guys as we can. So take good care and we'll see you soon.